Hey friend, Chris Vandeviver here from whylogicprorules.com, the website that helps you get the most you can out of Apple's Logic Pro 10. Today in our 30-day series, I wanna show off some of the awesome features of the Vintage EQ Collection. This is relatively new, at least in the last couple of years, and I think they don't get the credit they deserve. Now, the Vintage EQ Collection is three emulations of famous hardware analog EQs. If we take a look at the mixer, we have the console EQ, which emulates a Neve 1073, the tube EQ, which emulates both a Poltec EQP1A and a Poltec MEQ5. There's the two different EQs. And then also the graphic EQ, which emulates an API 560. They sound great, but they're even better because they've been adapted with some improvements in terms of their workflow. So first I have a riff here and let's take a quick listen to what we're working with. Not my usual fare, but why not? So first thing, let's dig into the console EQ. Now I love each of these individual EQs, but the console EQ to me is the best of the bunch because it's the simplest of the bunch. You have a high pass filter, you have a low and a high shelf. The high shelf is fixed at 12K, but of course it extends further down the higher you boost. And the mid band is our parametric band, which we can set the frequency. So the low shelf, you can set the frequency anywhere between 35 Hertz and 220 Hertz. In the mid band, you can go as low as 360 Hertz and up to 72K. And this is a very famous EQ. I mean, I interned at a studio where they were putting together an entire console, cleaning up all these Neve EQ and preamps so they could load the thing up and it was this EQ. There's something to be said for simplicity and I feel like a lot of folks overlook this for the channel EQ and don't even think about it just because it seems too simple, but it's really fantastic. The graphic EQ is made up of 10 frequency bands and in the original EQ, you just had 10 fixed frequencies. You couldn't adjust the frequency at all for any of the bands. But with the Logic graphic EQ, you can actually set the tune for this EQ. So if we set it back to its original zero, we have 31 Hertz, 63 up to 16 K, but you can push it up or push it down. And one of my favorite things about this EQ is that you can get up to 16 and 32 K, which you think you couldn't even hear, but I don't know, the EQ adds a nice air and presence to signals. And I even have a video all about this, which I'll link in this video. And the Vintage 2 BQ is great because it's two EQs that have these overlapping frequencies and have some interesting curves. The classic pull tech technique was to use this low frequency band, which offers both low attenuation, so reducing, and low boost. And they both center around the same frequency. So you can both boost and cut at the same time. And it's just very interesting results that you can achieve because of this. But there's also a nice texture to this EQ that feels just smooth and just adds a nice vibe on whatever you put it on. And this is what people love about this EQ. Now we're gonna start test driving some of these EQs, but I'm just quickly explaining what each brings to the table. What I love about the vintage EQs more than anything is the output section. Now each of these EQs emulate the hardware and part of that emulation is just sort of the tone of the EQ itself, even if you're not EQing. It adds a nice vibe, it adds a nice sort of like compression distortion at the same time, but in a subtle manner. And as far as I know, the output modeling uses the same technology as Space Designer. So it's convolution style of processing, but instead of reverb, it's the tonality of these EQs. So I just wanna quickly compare turning these off and on for the electric piano, the bass, and the guitar. My drum graphic EQ here is actually doing some EQ, so I don't wanna give a false impression. But we're gonna set each of these drive knobs to 5.5. So let's dredge this up. Same thing with the console EQ. Cool, so let's check it out. I'm gonna play and then take them away and then reintroduce them. I think it just causes those instruments to immediately stand up and they feel like they occupy more space in the mix, but in a way where you can almost hear each instrument a little better than you could before. And they each have their own emulation. So a console EQ, tube and graphic, three different output models, but you can swap the different models with the different EQs. So if you wanna use the console EQ in terms of EQing, but you wanna use the output modeling of the graphic EQ, no problem, just switch it up. Another thing that's awesome about these EQs is that you can select 
each of these frequencies and this will react as the actual hardware would have reacted because the hardware would only snap to these particular frequencies, but you can also sweep in between the different values, which is pretty awesome. And also we can adjust the phase for these different signals. So if you want the natural phase response of the hardware, just stick with that. But if you're working with something like a multi-mic drum kit, phase relationships are very important. You don't want to accidentally start rotating the phase of different signals, and then you got to constantly flip the phase back and forth with a gain plugin to try to get the best relationship. In that case, you could set it to linear. So you're not introducing phase shift, but you still get the benefit of the vintage EQs for EQing. In fact, I have a console EQ on the snare drum. So let's hear the snare drum in relation to the overhead and hi-hat and ride. We'll just leave out the kick, but we'll swap the phase response here. So check it out. Let's hear it in natural mode. Back to linear. To my ears, it just sounds a bit better. It sounds tighter with the rest of the kit. Now again, with the console EQ, it's just really amazing how smooth this thing is and how simple it is. Let's take a listen to this keys and just play around with some of the bands to hear what they sound like. I mean, super smooth. It sounds really nice in my opinion. And then we have the high pass filter, which introduces an 18 dB per octave high pass filter up to 300 Hertz and starts at 50 Hertz. Now with the graphic EQ, let's take a quick listen to what that sounds like on the guitar, especially for this top end air, which I absolutely love. I'm just going to start boosting 32 and 16 K just to hear what this sounds like. Let's make sure we're in a busy part. I mean, that is awesome. It sounds really good. And then with our bass track here, with the 2BQ, we're going to do that classic pull tech technique where we're going to boost and attenuate at the same frequency. So I'll start at 30 Hertz and then we'll start to sweep up, but check it out. Even with the low boost and the low attenuation with the exact same dB, so it's boosting by 3 dB, cutting by 3 dB, yeah, we're still getting this low end boost in the bass. That's pretty nice. And just like with the console EQ, you can actually click on the different values and the knob will snap to those values. And on the original unit, you know, you would pick between 200 hertz, 300 hertz, 5, but you can also sweep in between, which again, is just so awesome and classy. And the last couple of ideas that I want to give you is I highly recommend that if you're mixing your projects and you have like your drum tracks, bass tracks, guitars, vocals, you have these groups of instruments, first create a track stack for all of those groups of instruments. So in this case, I have a drum track stack. And then if I had multiple guitars, I would create a guitar track stack. And then for the bass, I would just create one just for the heck of it. And any keys, you know, create these track stack groups 
and then place a vintage EQ on the bus itself so that all of these tracks are being summed together into one of these vintage EQs and set the drive, I don't know, four, maybe five on the output dial on each individual instance of the vintage EQ. You don't even have to be EQing. And just take note of the vibe and life that these things introduce to your mixes. Just bypass and then reintroduce like we did earlier in the video. I bet you'll find that your mixes suddenly just glue together, just snap to attention and feel like they're playing together just so much better than they were previously. I do this for every mix that I work on. And side note, I add a touch of fat effects with the soft saturation on the stereo output, maybe five to 10%. Oh man, and your mixes just bloom as a result. They just add those intangible things that everybody wants, which is like glue and warmth, presence and all the good stuff. Try it out. So I hope that was helpful for you. If it was, as always, I highly recommend subscribing to the YouTube channel, YLogic Pro Rules, or subscribing on the website itself, YLogicProRules.com. Every week I'm posting new videos, new emails, and posts to help you get the most you can out of Apple's Logic Pro 10. Thanks so much, and I'll see you tomorrow in this series.